Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There are great benefits for following the Lord, being obedient to His Word, applying His truth to one's life. When we demonstrate our commitment to Him, that will bring about a manifestation of His commitment to us. Now, God loves us. He has demonstrated that commitment by sending His only begotten Son into the world. And that son laid down his life. So he has already done everything. The question is, are we going to be a recipient of those good things, those promises that God wants to bestow upon us? Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to Psalm 18, the book of Psalms and Psalm 18. We began this Psalm last week. We did the first half of it, and now we're going to look at part two. And one of the things we see is how there's indeed, and we talked about this word last week, that is the word for recompense, that is a payment. And when we demonstrate faithfulness, when we apply truth to our life, God will respond. He will move in accordance with our willingness to obey him and the benefits the outcome the results of god moving in our life those results are wonderful marvelous they satisfy and they bring victory into our life so look with me to where we left off now remember this psalm has that inscription in hebrew it's the first verse in english it is not so there's this one verse uh, discrepancy between the English and the Hebrew. The Hebrew is one verse ahead. So we're going to begin with verse 26 in Hebrew. And again, that's 25 in English. And please just remember, based upon the verse citation I get, if you're following in English, you'll have to subtract one number from that verse that I give you. We read here verse 26 with, and the next word is a word chasid. Now, this word is a form of the Hebrew word chesed, which is grace, many times translated loving kindness, God's faithful love, his steadfast love. And when we see it in this form, chassid, it is someone who has received God's grace, but, and here's the key, he demonstrates God's grace. This is the objective. We need to be people that not only have received God's grace, but having received it by faith, that we demonstrate it in our life, that fact. So it says, with the one who has received grace, you will be gracious. And what that means is that God will move as we demonstrate the grace that we have received and we're gracious to other people. That word can be kind, demonstrating a steadfast love. When we do that to others, God is going to respond in bringing grace. And remember something, there is an inherent relationship between grace and the will of God. I believe I shared this in either the first part of this psalm or in another message that, that seldom when people, and there's an emphasis on grace today among many people, and that's wonderful. Their whole ministry is based upon grace, grace, and grace. I'm not against that. But the problem is that many times in their desire to emphasize and elevate grace, 
they do not speak about one of the objectives of grace. And that is that the will of God would be maintained. That grace empowers me, provides what I need so I can fulfill the will of God. So do not simply understand grace as something that God provides for forgiveness, His mercy, so that we are not eternally judged. That is indeed part of grace. But once you receive that, we need to mature and grow and realize, as the book of Titus teaches, that there is a second outcome of grace, and that is that it teaches us to live godly and properly, soberly, with the right understanding and intent when in this present world. And when we live soberly with that right intent, what will be the outcome? It will be that the will of God is fulfilled. So we read, with a gracious one, you will be gracious. With a man, and the next word, and we need to talk about this, it is the word tamim. Frequently, this word is translated blameless, and that's fine. But the blamelessness of such a person comes because, and here's the important point, it comes because one relies, one understands that it's only through God's support, trusting in Him, leaning upon Him, that His will will be maintained. His will will be performed. So we read, with a man that is blameless, you, speaking of God, you will be blameless. Meaning this, all of God's obligations and realize we are by faith through a covenant, the new covenant, there are benefits. God has, and this is just part of what a covenant is, God has obligated himself. So when we are relying upon him, it brings about the fulfillment of God's promises. When we look to some other means, trust in someone else, something else, what happens? We're not going to experience God's, God's fidelity. He's always faithful. You see, God says, if you trust in me, these will be the outcomes. But if you do not trust in me, then God is still faithful. How? Not by providing these things. God is not going to provide that which is good to someone who is behaving in disagreement with his word. Let's move on to the next verse. 27 in Hebrew, 26 in English. With, and the next word is a word bar, but it has a noon attached to it. What does that do? It puts it in the passive. So one who has become, has been made pure. And purity is a very important aspect. Now, we have two words in Hebrew. We have the word tahor, which is normally purity. But there's also the word bar, which can be a natural purity, meaning as God intended. To be in the state that God wanted something to be in, in fulfillment with God's paradigm, His order, His will. So with the one who is made pure, you will be pure, meaning this. There are God's attributes, His ways. And when we demonstrate God's purpose, when we are faithful to His, His commands, then God is going to once again respond according to what He promised. Most of the time, the commandments of God comes with a, a blessing. That's why Moses says, I set before you today both life and death, blessing and curse. What's he talking about? He's speaking about the Torah. So the Torah comes with blessing and curse. If you fulfill the purpose of the commandment, 
you are going to see that outcome blessing so this is what it speaks about you will be pure you will bring about the the proper the natural outcome of obedience of an individual your response to that but if and notice this word here but if you ikesh this is word for stubborn and an important quality of this word is that it's willful it is not simply failing to do something because I did not know I should do that. I was not aware of it. But it's a word which means to reject, to rebel, to deny. And what David is saying here is, if one is stubborn, then God tit patel. What's tit patel? Well, it's a word, and it's fun sometimes to see how the word is used throughout the Scripture. Now, we know there's a river. Normally, rivers, they don't just move straight, do they? We say that they meander, they go like this. And the idea here of this meandering is a degree of evasiveness. So when someone, someone is stubborn, the outcome of that is God's going to evade that person. He's going to be evasive. You're not going to feel his presence. You're not going to be a recipient of his provision. All these things are going to avoid you. You will, and we could translate it, you will avoid a stubborn person. Next verse. Verse 28 in Hebrew, 27 in English. For you, and then he speaks about what God will do to those who, notice what it says, am ani. This is a humble people. So you, oh God, that's the implication, for you with a humble people, you will save. This is a word of deliverance. So humility brings God's saving, delivering power into our life. But, Keep reading. But the eyes that are lifted up, these are proud eyes, haughty eyes. The eyes that are lifted up, what does he say he will do? He says, you will humble. And it's really not the word humble, but it's the word to humiliate would be a better understanding. It's word to bring low in stature. So God will humiliate those who are, are prideful, who have haughty eyes. Next verse. For you, and here's another wonderful benefit. He says here, you will enlighten my lamp. So David wants illumination. He has that, that lamp and he wants God to illuminate it so that he can see things in light of God's illumination. Now, illumination, I've heard many people teach that there is a, a connection in our language between illumination and what we could call influence, a right, a godly influence. So David is playing for God to illuminate properly his life so he can make right decisions. O oh Lord, my God, you, and this is word to make again light. It's a different word, but it's a synonym. You will make light my darkness. And what he's speaking about here is these dark times that I'm absent a revelation. I, I do not know how to make the right decision. I'm lacking information. God will come and he will provide, provide illumination so that we see things. And by the way, this word is used not just for a normal light, like lighting a lamp, but this is the word that's used, for example, in, in prophecy for the sun and the moon giving its light. And we know that it's a powerful, strong light. And here's something else. We know from the book of Genesis that, that the sun and the moon, its light provides guidance and also a, a informing of the times and the seasons, not just when to go, where to go, but the times in which we are living. Verse 29 in English, 30 in Hebrew. 
For in you, and I would emphasize this, you know, one of the statements that Paul said so frequently in his epistle is in Messiah, in Messiah. And Paul points out that there are numerous blessings for being in Messiah. I've shared that the whole concept of predestination in the biblical definition of that is only relevant for those who are in Messiah. So predestination has nothing to do with God choosing someone for salvation, but what that one who is in Messiah is going to receive, God's predestined blessings for those who have accepted the gospel, and that's how one finds himself in Messiah. So he says, in you I will run, and then we have the word battalion. And and the implication here is that David is going to run, and some will say he will run and he will be like a battalion. That means his power and strength. Or some will say David will run, and it's like a battalion who's against him will be driven away. So which is right? Well, look at the second part of this verse. It says, in my God, notice, in my God, I will, and this is a word for leap over a a wall or a fortress. So here, it's not David becoming a wall or a fortress, but him leaping over it. And therefore, that gives us insight because this is poetry. What is the number one characteristic of Hebrew poetry? Parallelism. So if we have in the second part, David overcoming a wall, leaping over a fortress, therefore, David is going to run and he's going to chase away or he is going to run and avoid the battalion, the soldiers who are trying to to kill him, oppose him. Verse 31 in the Hebrew 13 English. The God, his way is blameless. Now notice the definite article, ha-el, not just a God, but the God, the one and only God. Setting aside anything to do with idolatry and idols and false gods and and religions of this world which are all a deceit he says the god blameless is his way so if we want to experience blamelessness that is if we want to live in a way that that personifies purity righteousness and holiness we're going to be committed to his way And when we're not in his way, then we're going to see impurity, that which is unrighteous, that which is displeasing to God, characterize our life. He says, the word of the Lord, and this verse ends with this word, tsirufa. Tsirufa, it's a word for refining. Here it's being refined. Now God's word's perfect, but his word, His perfect word to us has a refining aspect. And it's his perfect word that refines us, that places us on his way. That's why it's absolutely necessity, an absolute necessity that we rely upon God's word. If we're not in his word, we're not going to be refined and we won't have the ability, the knowledge, the insight, the illumination in order to get in his way, the way that he wants us to travel. Verse 30, same one, verse 31 at the bottom. A shield is him for all. So God's a shield, a defense for everyone. And this is in the plural for all that takes uh, shelter in him. And this is a word for trusting. So it's a shelter, but we don't experience his protection, that shield, unless we trust him. And notice this is a place as well that speaks of location. It's trust in God that moves us to 
these safe places. If we're not demonstrating trust, we're not going to experience God's shield, his defense in our life. Verse 32 in Hebrew, verse 31 in English. For who is God except the Lord? Now we see that sacred, that holy, that unique name, that yud Hey vav Hey, those four letters. And he says, for who is God except the Lord? And who, and the implication is, is the rock. And this usually has to do with the rock of our salvation. And the word sur can also, it's one of the terms that Messiah is called by. Who is the rock except our God? So the Lord, there is none besides him, and he alone is our rock. Next verse. Once again, it speaks about Ha'el, the God. And it's to, to distinguish him from all that is proclaimed as divine or godly. God is unique. The God, and this is a word for supplying provision giving equipment so god we could say is the one who equips me and the next word is with strength it's the same word for a soldier or even an army so god equips me with strength with power and he gives and here's the key the same word this word blameless he gives blamelessness my way my way he gives god's way or in here the way that david's traveling david's way he says again he makes it blameless verse 34 33 in english meshave shave is equal so meshave changes it to a verb and it it likens something it equates something so here, what David is saying is, my feet are being equated. They are being made like deers. Now, what do deers do with their feet? They are gracious to, to run and leap. When a deer experiences danger, they flee. And it says here, in keeping with this concept of fleeing, notice what it says. And upon ba motai, these are high places. And upon the high places, it says, He, this is the God, He will stand me. So this is, and he's been talking about this, He will position us in safety. What causes God to do that? Now, God is sovereign, but there's laws, there's principles. So when I say, what causes God? God has laws, spiritual laws. And when we disobey them, the outcome is no response from God. But God has obligated himself when we obey them. That obedience will cause God to respond. Why? He's established these laws. He wants to do these things. So he will set, he says, David, and upon the high places, he will set me. Verse 35, 34 in English. He teaches my hand for war. And bends the bow, and not just any bow, but a bronze bow, which is a strong one. He says, my arms bend the bow of bronze. And you will give to me the shield of your salvation. So here again, we see over and over in this, these last few verses of this section, God promising protection, God being a shield, God placing us out of the reach of the enemy. And this is all brought about by us affirming and responding to the instructions of God. See, sometimes I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier concerning grace. All too often, people feel that grace means God. It's all up to you. Well, God says, I will be gracious, but 
that grace should produce in our life a fidelity to his word and that fidelity to his word has benefits in this age also in the age to come the kingdom of god but primarily here david is speaking about the benefits that he has in his life because david trust in god relies upon god verse 36 the second part and your right hand and this is a word in modern hebrew if you go to for example a nursing home you get care that that's around the clock we use this word so here when we look at it in the biblical language it says your right hand oh god we could say supports me sustains me cares for me and your humility now to me this is so important it is because god is a humble god he who is perfect he who is all things he who is absolutely sovereign but it says your humility what does it say it multiplies me so the fact that god would take notice of me take notice of you there's so many human beings but nevertheless god he humbles himself in order to minister and and this word can mean to make great to provide for in an abundant manner this is what god's willing to do and this is a demonstration an example for us if god being god humbles himself in order to bless mightily help mightily work mightily in someone's life how much more so should we verse 37 36 in english you make broad my my step now some will say path but it's literally the word step and the implication is if if you have a very narrow place to to place your foot you might fall you might stumble so this is a a imagery of security safety that god makes for our foot a broad way underneath me david says and not and this uses his word for for it's the modern hebrew word for an ankle but it's related to his foot he says my ankle will not slip so again and again we see security safety that david is being made sure-footed in order to travel and to move forward in the purposes of god 38 in hebrew 37 in english i will pursue my enemies and i will overtake them and i will not return meaning i'm not going to stop i'm going to pursue them and i'm not coming back home i will not return until he says basically they are finished they are consumed there's no more evidence of them and how is david david able to do that well notice what it says here i wound them and the one who rises up they are not able so those who want to rise up against me they are not able to they fall underneath my foot so what are we seeing now when we make god our defense when we travel his way when we trust in him god will supply power that's what we saw he will give security safety and thirdly god is going to notice what he says here in this verse that he is going to wound the enemy and that he is going to bring victory and that's the key so he provides he equips us he becomes our shield our defense he he makes our way safe and in the end because we have trusted in him god is going to give us victory over the enemy 
verse 40. 39 in English. Once more, it's that same word that we saw in the Hebrew verse, verse 33, where it says, and you have equipped, equipped me with power for war. Now, David, he was beloved by of God. That's what the term David means, the beloved one. But notice that David, for most of his adult life, when he was serving, he had conflict. There was warfare against him. And David's revealing here that you equipped me with power for war. And you, this would be the word to make bow down. It could be understood in a idiomatic way that you subdue the ones who rise up against me. You, you subdue them. You make them bow down underneath me. My enemy, next verse, verse 41, 40 in English, my enemies you have, have set to me, and this is, is the back of their neck. Now, the back of the neck, two things. It is showing that they're fearful, that they have turned away, that they are defeated, and here's the key. They are vulnerable. So when we trust God, when we accept him to equip us and prepare us for this spiritual conflict that has physical battles to it, obviously, we are going to find that we overcome and our enemy, we will overtake them and we will get to the very back of their neck, meaning they will be made vulnerable to us. Keep reading. And, and the ones that hate me, he says, I will, and this is word for exterminate. Now, I did some research on this word. If you're a Hebrew speaker, uh, the word smichut, smichut has to do with that which is perpetual, that which is forever. And this extermination, this defeat, this destruction of the enemy, they ultimately are going to experience a eternal defeat. Verse 42 in Hebrew, verse 41 in English. These enemies, he says here, they cry out, Ve'en Moshia, there is no Savior. Unto the Lord, meaning they cry out unto the Lord even, and he does not answer them. And the question we have to ask is, why doesn't he? And the answer is this, because they have no covenantal relationship with him. They do not call in faith. They call out in desperation. Let me give you an example of, of the point we need to embrace. Let's talk for a moment about repentance. There is an inherent relationship between repentance and faith. When I truly have faith, it brings about repentance likewise when i repent i will grow in my faith god will supply more but here's the key when we are sincere to repent because we acknowledge this is wrong this is not the right way this is not what i should be doing doing and when we're sincere god receives that but if our calling out is simply because we're being defeated, we're having problems, we're, we're, we're suffering. If the motivation of our calling to the Lord is simply, I don't like my current situation, but I'm not affirming God and His ways and His wills, then God will not answer. And this is so important in rightly understanding salvation. Too many times today, when I hear people offering the gospel, it is an insufficient invitation. They say, anyone who, who loves God, just come down and receive him. That's, that's not proper. Now, we should love God, but it's inadequate. It's insufficient. Any of you who want to be forgiven of your sins, any of you want God's benefit in your life, anyone wants his help in your life, come, come receive him. Here again, 
God will do all this, but that's not a biblical invitation to the gospel. A biblical invitation to the gospel involves repentance, and that is an acknowledgement of sin. If you do not acknowledge sin in your life and that his death upon that cross, his shedding of his blood, is the only way to receive forgiveness, for your sins to be to be redeemed by, by him, if you do not repent, you do not acknowledge sin, you're not under the conviction of sin, meaning you feel bad and grieved over the sin in your life, you are not a candidate for salvation. And today, that's why it will say, many went out from us in the last days, denying the truth. Why? As John says in 1 John, because they were not of us. They were never of us. When God says, I, I don't know you to these individuals, see, here's the problem. People make all types of statements, and then I ask them a question. What is the significance of this phrase, I don't know you? What is the significance of that being in the Greek perfect tense? Now, we can disagree, but we need to answer the questions. When I'm recording this, we're planning on having a, a, a Skype or a, a live stream in regard to the rapture. And it's fine that we disagree and we debate and such, but we have to look at some important questions and be able to answer them. You can't have a position about some theological thing. And when people deal with the relevant questions that relate to that issue, you say, well, I don't know about that. I never thought about that. I don't know the answer to that. I didn't know that was related to that. I didn't know that these were key verses that spoke to this issue. But putting all that aside, I still have my opinion. That is someone who is not a student of the Word of God. It is highly problematic. So look at what the Scripture is saying. He says, unto the Lord, they're calling out unto the Lord, but he says, the, the, he will not answer. Verse 43, 42 in English. I will, and this is a word for pulverize, like that word. It means to, to beat into powder. So he could say, I will make them like powder, and then he says, as dust. So I will pulverize them like powder or as dust upon the face of the wind. Now, if there's dust and the wind comes, what happens? It just blows it away. And what happens to that which has been pulverized into powder, into dust? It's no more. Never to be seen again. Same thing here in the second part. Ketit chutzot. Tit chusot is the, the, the dirt upon a road. And because the road is traveled upon over and over, what happens to that dirt? It disappears. It gets worn down. It's no more. And that's where he says, I will empty them. They will be no more. All that they had, it will be just pulverized into nothing. Why? Because they did not trust in the Lord. Well, we're coming now to the third section tonight in the second half of Psalm 18 that begins with verse 44 in the Hebrew text, 43 in the English. And it speaks about here that God, and this is word for deliverance, providing refuge, working in a way that we are delivered from striving people, people who love strife. God will deliver us from that. And he says, and by the way, we're going to see in these last few verses of Psalm 18 that David, remember, one of the ways that we speak about Messiah is Ben David, the son of David. And in this, David is speaking about what God is doing for him. But in actuality, these things give us a greater insight in understanding what God is going to bring about through his son and for his son in establishing his kingdom. So we read, and you have set me as the head 
of nations. Now, under David's leadership, the nation of Israel conquered many people. But under the son of David, Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus, he will conquer all people. And it says, a people that I did not know, even nations that David was not aware of, it says, they served me. Verse 45, 44 in English, le shema ozen. Ozen is ear. Shema is what the ear hears. So a hearing, a report, they hear of me. So we're going to see that those nations, people far away, they are going to hear of David. Even B'nai Nahar, that is those who are not part of God's covenant people. And what are they going to do? It says, Yechakesh Li. Now, this word, if you look at it, by and large, it's a word of denying something. But it says they, or literally he, this, this uh, foreigner, this, this would be the right understanding of a non-Jew, the term here, when we talk about B'nai Nahar. They will deny for me, meaning this, their objectives, their plans, their allegiance to their country, all of this, they are going to deny. What does that mean? Most Bibles say, they will be subdued unto me. That's the implication, but the word is that they are going to deny themselves. It speaks about true faith. Faith causes us to deny. And it's only when we deny these things of this world, our desires, our wants, our perspectives, then and only then are we going to be subjected to God. Verse 46. Once again, this term, B'nai Nechar, a foreigner, one who is not Jewish, the normal understanding of Gentile. B'nai Nechar, a, a non-Jew. Someone who initially did not have a, a covenant with God. It says, they are going to be dried up. And because of that, it says, they, and this is a word, charig, is something that deviates, an exception. And what these are going to do, it says, they will deviate from, and it's, the miscarriage, a miscarriage is kind of a way of life, a routine. So what it's saying is this, David being exalted, David being victorious, David being the leader is going to cause these foreigners, these who are not part of B'nai Yaakov, the sons of Jacob, they are going to hear, they are going to Find everything of themselves being dried up, emptying themselves, humbling themselves in order that they can deviate from their ways, their routines. And in doing so, what's going to happen? They are going to have the same opportunity to become part of the family of God. Verse 47. Now David is going to end these last few verses with praises and adoration to God. Verse 47 in Hebrew, 46 in English. The Lord lives, blessed is my rock, and be exalted, the God of my salvation. Now, I believe there's a song that includes these words, but what a wonderful sentence, a great verse, one that we should meditate on. What does that mean? to prayerfully recite over and over. Pour it into our heart, this fact. Say it again. The Lord lives and blessed is my rock. The God of my salvation, he be exalted. For the God, once more, Ha'el, the God, he gives, and this is vengeance to me. And this is an idiom for victory. He gives a retribution to me from my enemies. Victory. It's this same word for, for vengeance, but it's related to being delivered and seeing those who afflicted you defeated. 
And that's what it's saying here. And it's so important that we see when we look at verse 48 in the Hebrew, 47 in English, it's hanoten, the one who gives. It's in the Hebrew participle form. And whenever that form, we can also call it the present participle, whenever that form is appearing, it's for the purpose of emphasizing something. So the God gives vengeance to me. And notice what it says. Most also talk about him subduing, but I like this word. It is the word, and let me just read it, vai yidaber. What's yidaber? He will speak. So even though it's translated, he will subdue, that's why it's so important to do word studies. Because the word simply means that God will bring the enemies, other people, into subjection. Why? He simply speaks it into being. God can do all things simply by speaking. Now, this has caused many to have a false theology. Because God proclaims, and it is, don't ever think that that goes for us. No, we agree with God. That's what the power is. Not I proclaim, I, I decree. When people say that, they're usually false teachers. No, I affirm the promises of God. I respond to what God decrees, and then I'm a recipient of those good things. But it's what he has decreed. It's not what I decree because now I'm part of his family and I can do that same thing. That is heresy. It is apostasy. And it's spreading today among many congregations. So he will speak peoples underneath me, giving me authority. Verse 49, 48 in English. And he says, my deliverer from my enemies, even from the ones who rise up, what happens? He says, you will lift me up. So as the enemies rise up, what is God going to do? Once again, he says that you, O oh God, are going to lift me up from the man of Hamas. That is a man who is violent for the sake of violence. He enjoys the suffering of people. And David says, from such a man, you will, look at the end of this verse, you will deliver me. Verse 50, 49 in, in uh, English. Therefore, here again, praise. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord. And to your name, I will sing. And the implication is, I will sing praise. And again, these are wonderful verses that we should read over and over. Because each time we do prayerfully, God will, will speak to us. God will give us greater understanding. That's to work in the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach us as we find Messiah promising. For example, study carefully John 15 and 16 about the work of the Holy Spirit that he will teach us all things. How? When we pour over his word, not just when we sit around doing nothing, ignoring his word and not serving him. God's not going to be our teacher then. But when we are serving him and we want to serve him in a more excellent way and we rely upon the word of God, God will, through the Holy Spirit, his spirit, the spirit of Messiah, teach us, bring us into righteousness. So therefore, on account of all these works of God in David's life, he says, I will give thanks among the nations, O Lord, and to your name, your character. This faithful character based upon a covenantal obligation that God has made to his people. He says, I will sing. And the implication, I will sing praise. Now we're ready for the last verse. Verse 51 in, in Hebrew, verse 50 in English. Magdil Yeshuot Malko. Here he says, and makes great salvations. Now, what David is saying, and this is a great verse, <coughs> excuse me, about a messianic understanding. 
Even though David, it was applied in one sense to him, and God fulfilled this. But it's going to be fulfilled in a greater, in a broader way to, to Yeshua. When he says, speaking to God, Magdil, that is the word for making great, exalting, making great Yeshua. The term Yeshua means Jesus. The term Yeshua sounds similar, but the accent and the spelling is slightly different. Yeshua is salvation. So God is saying here, David's speaking it out. He makes great salvations. Not Yeshua, but Yeshua. Salvations of his king. And what king are we speaking about? Keep reading. Ve'ose. And he makes grace. Chesed. And again, this word, ose, is that participle form I was telling you about, or in the present tense, depending upon your training. It, it has to do with emphasizing that he is the one that makes chesed. Now, what do we derive from this? There's a biblical connection between grace, chesed, and salvation, abundant salvation. He says, and he makes chesed of his Messiah. For his Messiah, but literally can be translated of his Messiah. To David and to his seed, ad olam, forever, unto foreverness. That's the promise. And remember, and I'll close with this. There's a relationship between the word olam and not just forever and of all time and all space, but it's also a reference for the kingdom. So he makes great salvations for his king. And he makes grace of his Messiah for David and for his seed forever. In my estimation, this 18th Psalm is a powerful Psalm. One that when we are encountering conflict, when we are experiencing the attack of the enemy, it is a great Psalm to study. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.